I'm Michael. This is Lessons from the Screenplay. It's been over six years since The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo was released, and it remains one of my favorite David Fincher films. It's an intriguing murder mystery, as well as a story about two unfamiliar characters with a unique relationship. But the film is also interesting from a structural perspective. As Fincher said of the script, There was really no way to take what Larson had written and get it into three acts. And so we sort of had to make our peace with the idea of a five-act structure. In my last video on the Avengers, I looked at the elements of classical five-act structure. But despite having five acts, the girl with the dragon tattoo doesn't fit that model. Instead, it's full of abnormalities, where the subplot is the focus of much of the film, and at times it feels like it swaps protagonists. This is why it was the first film I thought of when I heard Fincher's recent quote where he implied that Marvel films are lassoed and hogtied by three acts. As I said in my last video, I have become obsessed with this statement, and today I want to explore its deeper meaning. To see how Marvel films are constrained by three acts and narrative conventions, and how the girl with the dragon tattoo subverts them. To dissect the anatomy of an act, examining how a film can break the rules and follow them at the same time, and reveal the effort put into setting up the Fincher trilogy that never came to be. Let's take a look at the girl with the dragon tattoo. When David Fincher implied that the Marvel Cinematic Universe was lassoed and hogtied by three acts, he wasn't talking about the literal number of acts. He was referring to the fact that most Marvel films have to be essentially the same. They need to be widely accessible so they can reach a large enough audience to make money, which historically means following certain narrative conventions. I've identified three conventions in particular that I found in almost all Marvel films, and which Fincher likes to subvert. The first convention is that nearly the entire film is about a single, clear protagonist. Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, there is a single, clear protagonist driving the plot forward. Subplots for love stories and supporting characters exist, but they take a back seat. Second, these subplots are resolved just before the climax or immediately after. This allows all the loose ends to come together and be tied up nicely in the end. Usually, this means the subplots have their own climax just before the protagonist journeys on to the final battle, or they resolve right after, but quickly so the film can end as soon as possible. And finally, the third convention is that they closely follow Sid Field's three-act paradigm. We meet a hero who wants something but can't have it, they make a difficult choice to go after it, the struggle turns out to be harder than they expected, they make another choice to become the person they need to be, they defeat the bad guy, movie over. Almost all films follow these conventions, and to be clear, a film isn't automatically bad because it follows these conventions, nor is a film automatically good just because it breaks them. But as Fincher implies in his quote, when you have to tick all these boxes, there's only so much room to play around. So what does it look like when you don't tick all these boxes? Well, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo does have a clear protagonist in Mikael Blomqvist, but a significant portion of the film is spent on Lisbeth's story. The subplots of the film certainly do not resolve just before or immediately after the climax of the main plot. And while you could probably apply the three-act structure to the film, as you can with almost all films, it certainly does not fit tidily within the walls of Sid Field's paradigm. By breaking these conventions, the girl with the dragon tattoo can tell a complex story with multiple plot threads, letting us get to know a main character other than the protagonist in a much deeper way. So does the film not have any structure whatsoever? Of course it does. Despite subverting the three-act paradigm, screenwriter Steven Zalian made sure that each individual act contained the essential elements of story. In his book, Into the Woods, A Five-Act Journey Into Story, John York writes, Fractal theory dictates that every act will contain all the essential elements of story. Protagonist, antagonist, inciting incident, journey, crisis, climax, and occasionally, resolution. Every act in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo has each of these elements telling a story unto itself while playing a unique role in the overall film. So let's dissect each act to see how they use the essential elements of story to achieve this. Act 1. What will Mikkel do now that his life is ruined? This act's function is to set up the story. We meet the characters and learn what the film is about. The protagonist, Mikkel Blomqvist, has just been sued for libel and lost, so his desire slash journey is to hide from the world. I'm gonna go home, go on to the duvet for a week. But then he gets a phone call, the inciting incident, where he is enticed to meet Henrik Wenger. 
Henrik is the antagonist of this act, not because he's a bad guy, but because he's the one blocking Mikkel's desire to hide from the world. The crisis comes when Henrik asks Mikkel to solve a 40-year-old murder mystery, and the climax is when Henrik offers Mikkel the one thing he wants most. Hans Erik Wellerstrom. Revenge on the man who has just ruined Mikkel's life. The resolution is that Mikkel agrees to try to solve Henrik's mystery. Act 1 is a pretty standard first act, like you would find in most films. Act 2, however, is where things get more complex. Act 2. Can Mikkel uncover something new about Harriet's disappearance? The second act has to keep the main plot engaging while also spending half its time on something completely unrelated. So how does the screenwriter achieve this? He essentially makes the second act have two protagonists, with their elements of story running in parallel. The protagonist in the main plot is still Mikkel, and his antagonist is now the mysterious past that holds the secrets he's after. The protagonist of the subplot is Lisbeth, who is forced to report to a new guardian, Bierman, her antagonist. Mikkel's inciting incident comes when he speaks to the retired officer who was assigned to Harriet's case. This sets up Mikkel's desire slash journey. Answer the questions the officer never could by collecting new evidence and getting to know the Wenger family. Lisbeth's inciting incident comes when someone tries to steal her laptop and it ends up destroyed. Her desire slash journey is to be able to control her own money, but as a ward of the state, the only way to get it is through Bierman who she soon learns is not shy about abusing his power in the most horrific way. The crisis of Mikkel's plot comes when he flips through the old photos of Harriet and realizes she was afraid of someone. And the climax is when he realizes what the numbers and names in the diary mean. Mikkel has uncovered something new. The crisis of Lisbeth's plot comes when Bierman takes his abuse to a new extreme. And the climax is when she gets her brutal revenge. <coughs> Now that Mikkel knows he's not wasting his time with this investigation, the resolution of the act comes as he asks for a research assistant. This second act has two stories going on at once, one that moves the main plot forward, and another that provides a detailed portrait of Lisbeth, our other main character, who has yet to enter the main story. But in the third act, that will change. Act 3. Will Lisbeth get along with Mikkel and be able to help him? In the Sidfield paradigm model of a screenplay, Act 3 is where the story ends. But in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the third act is where our main characters meet for the first time. The protagonist is Mikkel, and this time Lisbeth is the antagonist of the act. She is the unknown quantity, the person who must be convinced. The inciting incident comes as Mikkel learns Lisbeth investigated him, violating his privacy by doing so. Mikkel's desire is to understand why Harriet was tracking the murders of young women in her diary, and asks Lisbeth to help. I want you to help me catch a killer of women. His journey involves looking for more evidence, as Lisbeth tracks down new information about the women who were killed. And all the while, they're figuring out their relationship. The crisis comes when Mikkel is shot at. Someone is trying to scare him away. This leads to the climax, where Lisbeth stitches him up and they begin a sexual relationship. This resolution signifies them becoming partners. I like working with you. I like working with you too. Act 4. Is there a connection between the Wenger Corporation and the murders? The fourth act contains what would be in the third act of a normal movie, the final showdown with the antagonist. Protagonist, Mikkel. Antagonist, Martin Wenger. Inciting incident, Mikkel and Lisbeth get permission to search the Wenger company's records desire slash journey, to find out if there is any connections between Vanga Industries and the towns where the women were killed. The crisis. Mikkel discovers that Martin is the killer and is captured. <laughs> the climax. Mikkel is saved in the last moment by Lisbeth, who chases Martin, causing him to die in a car crash. <laughs> Resolution. In the aftermath, Mikkel realizes that Harriet is still alive, and she is reunited with Henrik. This plays like the end of a normal film, where the act answers its own dramatic question, as well as the dramatic question of the main plot. It feels like the film should be over, because if it followed convention, it would be. But there are still several loose ends that need tying up. So instead, we move into the weirdest act. Act 5. What will happen with Venestrom, slash, what will become of Lisbeth and Mikkel? In the fifth act, there are again two stories happening at once. 
The one that is front and center is Elizabeth, the protagonist, taking down Venestrum, the antagonist. The inciting incident is when she hears Mikkel say that Venestrum probably won't get jail time for his crimes. Her desire is to give him the punishment he deserves, and her journey involves adopting a disguise, clever hacking, and stealing billions of dollars from him. The crisis comes when she successfully empties his bank accounts into her own, and the climax comes when it's announced that Venestrom was executed by his mob affiliates. Lisbeth's actions are fueled by her desire to see appropriate punishment be administered. But it's also an expression of her feelings for Mikkel, which I think is the more moving story of this act. Lisbeth, protagonist, realizes she has feelings for Mikkel, antagonist, during the inciting incident, when he agrees to lend her $50,000. Okay. Okay. It's the most anyone has ever trusted her. You want coffee? Her desire slash journey becomes to tell him how she feels. After taking down Mikkel's sworn enemy, she writes him a letter and buys him a gift. But the crisis comes when Lisbeth goes to give him the gift and sees that he's with Erica. The climax is when she chooses to turn around and throws the present in the trash. And the resolution. Heartbroken, she gets on her motorcycle and rides off. Each act of the girl with the dragon tattoo serves a unique function in the overall story, and several acts contain story beats not found in conventional films. But by making sure that each act has the essential elements, it ensures that it's never just showing a series of events happening, but rather telling a story. When reading the screenplay, I noticed that the last line of the script was strangely prophetic, when it explains that Lisbeth climbs onto her Honda, starts it, and drives off probably forever. The unconventional structure of the girl with the dragon tattoo wasn't there simply to provide interesting storytelling. It had to set up important backstory for Lisbeth. Even though we're not getting into it in great detail in the first movie, it has to inform everything that she does. We will get into it eventually. This is because everyone, the writer, the cast, even Fincher, assumed this film was going to be part one of a trilogy. The opening title sequence contains imagery from all three of the stories. Erica, Krister Mall, Bierman, Armansky, Miriam, and Annika, Mikkel's sister, all had to be cast and appear in small roles knowing they would be an important part of the next films. Players in a complex trilogy poised to challenge convention that would ultimately never be. This, I think, is the last key to understanding Fincher's quote about Marvel. When talking about signing on to do The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Fincher said, I wasn't that interested in the notion of making another serial killer movie as much as the studio was committed to the idea of a hard R-rated adult franchise. And I thought, I've been waiting my whole career to hear this. He wanted to turn the Dragon Tattoo trilogy into something thoughtful, adult, interesting, complex, and challenging. But when it was released, the Girl with a Dragon Tattoo made only $102 million. Five months later, the Avengers would make $600 million. Certainly more determines the success of a film than the conventionality of its narrative structure. But as an audience, we have become so programmed to expect a three-act structure and a tidy resolution that we often get uncomfortable when a story breaks that formula. But when a story isn't beholden to narrative conventions, and when we're willing to be uncomfortable, we get to have new experiences. Over the last decade, that kind of experimentation has been happening less and less in film and more and more in television. And as long as fun, safe films dominate the box office, that will continue to be the case. My personal takeaway from all this is that regardless of the medium you work in, it's important to learn the essential elements of story so your script is always compelling. It's important to learn the narrative conventions so you can anticipate what the audience is expecting. And it's important to learn all the rules so you know the best ways to break them. I've always found that the easiest way for me to learn the basic fundamentals of something is by watching others do it. This is why I love online tutorials, and whenever I find myself excited to learn a new skill, the first place I go is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with more than 17,000 classes in photography, filmmaking, and much, much more. Whether you want to learn a new piece of software or how to make a short film using stop motion animation, Skillshare has a class for you. And if your New Year's resolution was to learn something new, Skillshare is the perfect place to start. Which is why Skillshare is offering a limited time deal to get your first three months for only 99 cents. 
This offer is available until the end of January. But since it took me a while to get this video out, they're extending the deal for you guys to February 15th. So take advantage of this awesome deal today by going to the URL below and getting your first three months of Skillshare for 99 cents. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I've realized that if things keep going well, it's possible that I might hit a million subscribers this year, which is crazy. But I thought it'd be cool to do something fun for if that happens. So I wanna put it to you guys. What are some suggestions of a fun video I could do to mark a million subscribers? Uh, so let me know in the comments below any suggestions you have. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.